Please be seated. Are you happy also? So shall we begin? No formalities? Those of the guests who would like to inquire anything, ask any question, you may please come forward and come to the microphone over there. There don't seem to be any yes, interesting questions. You are, perhaps. Come on. <laughs> Sir. Well, Sam, how are you? Alhamdulillah. I'm not a guest, but uh, you always let us know that uh, the first question is the hardest to come. So if you permit me, I'd like to ask a question. Right. Do, Which, please. As well, recently in the media, we have seen that uh, the Reverend Moon is being uh, not allowed to come into this country. My uh, question is that uh, his people claim him to be uh, the Messiah and that he claims to be the second coming. And that uh, my question is that how do you see the Muni people and what proof should he bring with him of being the, a Messiah? You see, the claims attributed to Moon, <laughs> Reverend Moon, are contradictory. And uh, at different stages of the development of this faith, there have been different things attributed to him. And I have read some of his own speeches and uh, his own writings. And the, what I have understood from that is sim simply, in the end, un understandable. Because at times he claims to be the personification of Krishna. At other times he claims to be the personification of Jesus Christ. Yet at another time, he says that Jesus failed to perform his mission. And uh, there was yet somebody else higher than him to come who would fulfill the unfulfilled mission. Then he goes on claiming that other, there were other prophets than uh, the prophets of the line of Israelites who were also genuine prophets and he claims to be their representation as well. But not like the claim of Ahmadiyya community that all the prophets which had been prophesied, whose advent had been prophesied, were expected to come in the latter days, represented by one man, not by all different prophets themselves. His claim is uh, again diverse and contradictory. He claims that Hazrat Rasulullah was a prophet while Christianity was 100% right. He claims that he was only a prophet for simple preparation of the world, for the savages to be raised to the level where they could receive moon. You know, that sort of thing. And uh, God had his claim yet and also prophethood, they don't, they don't combine together. And the idea of sin and uh, Cain, murder, Cain murdering Abel is represented in such a way that I, we really wonder how a man in full command of his senses would accept him as a spiritual religious leader. He says that Cain and Abel is a story which will be repeated in this age. And Cain will, Abel would be revenged. But how? It would be through alliance between America and uh, Korea. And America and Korea are going to play the real leading role in the fulfillment of the messages contained in that story. And that alliance would be against North Korea and uh, communism. What such a philosophy can do for the rest of the world is unbelievable, unthinkable. But there is a very short response to your answer. 
having read Reverend Moon, I believe that this is a movement which simply cannot survive as a religious entity for long. It is involved in monetary things. He claims to be sinless and absolutely sinless, yet he was convicted by American courts to have uh, uh, you know, cheated the American exchequer by billions of dollars worth of money he saved fraudulently from income tax. And he was imprisoned. And he says that imprisonment, criminal imprisonment, was a sort of crucifixion for him. So he was crucified again. But what about Jesus' crucifixion? Was there any moral blemish on Jesus, even attempted by the Jews or his persecutors? None whatsoever. So the one who was innocent is blamed to be partly, you know, not entirely criminal, but partly blemished. He's, he's also claimed to have failed in the mission which he claimed he would perform. So he would not come again, according to him. It was Moon who would come again, and his past is very uh, I mean, obscure. We don't know what he has been doing before his imprisonment during the World War II, and how he uh, actually arose rose to some sort of fame and some sort of notoriety. But uh, these are all areas where further research has to be carried out. And I assure you that we have undertaken that. I have instructed the Jamaat all over the world to have more investigation made into all about the moon and the moonies, and uh, let us present for the first time the true image of the Muni faith, and uh, that too, with 100% evidence and proof, not by way of allegations. That is all I can say at this moment, right? As far as his pre prevention, from his, his being prevented from entering Britain is concerned, that is not uh, my concern. I'm not, uh, I think, fully competent to opine on that, because if it was just done for religious jealousies, then of course it is not wrong, right. But if the British government had some secret information regarding his plans and uh, such secret information led them to believe that he would indulge in the similar activities which in which he was found guilty of indulging in America, then of course the British government has the right to prevent such a person's entry. Thank you. Our next guest is Zeeshan Zulfikar from Crawley. Aslan. Your full name, Zeeshan what? Zeeshan Zulfikar. Zulfikar. My question is about jihad. Is that not as non MD say that jihad is the hidden pillar of uh, Islam, and they also say that MDs do not believe in jihad. Uh, I, can you just, say, uh, as I am on prison studying the, the MDR beliefs, can you just s uh, shed some light on this case? Right. You see, MDs believe in all the fundamentals of Islam and all the uh, detailed teaching to the last thought. We believe in the totality of the Holy Quran, and we believe that this book was not only valid 1400 years ago, it is still valid, it will continue to be valid as divine teaching which man must obey and follow. And we also believe in the word of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah to be the fine last authority in the world from the mouth of any prophet of of God. And no prophet can appear after him who could cancel even a jot of what he said. 
So in this overall setting of our belief, this allegation finds no room whatsoever. If at all, we must have been rep misrepresented by some, perhaps uh, inadvertently, but by some we know positively, intentionally. What, believe, what we believe is that jihad is a must for every Muslim. No single moment Muslim can live without jihad. But what is jihad? This is the issue. Is it Islamic jihad, what they represent it to be, to take up sword at, at, on the excuse of religious differences and to murder people for the crime of not agreeing with Islam? If that is jihad, then of course we do not agree with that. Because the Holy Quran doesn't agree with that either. Because Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu never murdered people just because of the religious differences. People came to meet him. He lived with the Jews, with the Christians, with the idolaters throughout his life and never murdered or ordered anyone to be murdered because he did not agree with the faith in which he believed. So there is no justification whatsoever for any scholar of Islam to misinterpret Islam on the issue of jihad and attribute a concept of jihad to the Holy Quran and to the conduct of Hazrat Muhammad Wasallam, which has no relationship with them. So what is jihad? The first jihad which is mentioned in the Holy Quran is the jihad with the Quran. So the Holy Quran tell, uh, is addressing Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu says, Wa jahid hum bihi jihadan kabira. With this book, strive against them with the help of this book. The great striving. So the greatest jihad of every Muslim is to strive for the victory of Islam with whatever lies in his capacity by way of the Quranic teachings or by way of an example, beautiful example set before the people by acting upon the Quranic teachings. This is the most wonderful jihad that one can think of and this is Islamic jihad. Number two, the second jihad mentioned in the Holy Quran and also in Hadith is jihad against your own evil dispositions, your evil inclinations, etc. And to continue to wage a war against your bad self, which would uh, continue to drag you to all that is satanic. And that is the jihad between light and darkness. And that jihad begins within a man individually and within a woman, by word man I mean both man and woman. And this is a jihad in which seldom we find people genuinely and seriously involved, yet they claim at the loudest of their voices, jihad, jihad, jihad. So these are the primary two jihad, which I have mentioned, which they totally ignore. The third in order comes jihad with soul. And what is that jihad? Can a fight with sword or bullets or guns be called holy? And if so, in what context? The Holy Quran is so clear on that, that there is no room for any ambiguity left if you read the Quran with due care and attention and honesty, of course. I have been quoting so often the fundamental verse concerning this jihad, the third type of jihad, which can be carried out with sword. By sword, I mean all weapons. And uh, this is found in a verse in Surah Al-Hajj. This is the first verse found in, Surah, in the Holy Quran, which speaks of a permission to wage a war against those who 
what, which those I'm going to explain now. Not against those who disagree with your faith. Not against those who, having heard your message, reject it. Not at all. The words, will you, when you hear, you'll be surprised how they could be misinterpreted by anyone. Permission is granted to those against whom the sword is already raised. Yokataluna, any Arab can understand the meaning. No one can fail to understand the import of this verse because simple injunction, a simple injunction expressed in simplest terms. The raising of sword, the fighting, is permitted to those against whom the swords have already been raised. First condition. Despite the fact that they have not committed any crime, they have given no cause of offense to anyone. But it is not over yet. Verily, God is, has full power to help such people when they raise sword under the permission of God. Now, this is also a very significant part of this verse and also of jihad because the scenario presented to us is that of a very weak people so weak and apparently defenseless that any Tom, Dick and Harry begins to raise sword against them and trample upon their rights despite the fact that they had not given anybody a genuine cause of offense so the Holy Quran is so wonderful when it says we are permitting you and we take the responsibility that if you use this permission you will find God at your back however weak you may be when we grant permission we are responsible that you will emerge victorious this is exactly the promise made in Allah Allah Nasrahim La Qadir to help them to victory is small thing for Allah. He is capable of doing what whenever he so decides. But the story of their persecution still continues, runs on. It says, Allazina ukriju min dayarihim haqqin. Such innocent people against whom the atrocity atrocities have been committed even to the extent they were they were turned out of their homes, out of their country out of their birthplaces, without any right of the people who turn them out. Then the Holy Quran tells us, Illa an yakuru rabbun Allah. The only crime they committed was, they said, God is our Lord, the Provident. Allah Rabbuna. And this is the only claim they made which annoyed the opponents to a degree that they started committing all sorts of cruelties against them and they are not yet satiated, they are not satisfied. Having turned them out of their homes, they are still after them. Now this is in a sort of prophecy in fact. It says you have come to Medina, you have been turned out of your homes, but the war is not over against you. The sword will yet be raised. And this time, if they come pursuing you, we permit you to fight back. This was indeed a prophecy of what happened at Badr. And the promise of Allah was kept so beautifully. Being small in number, being weak in other respects, you know, pitched against an army of trained soldiers, the very pick of Mecca, who were 1,000 who were mounted, who had all sorts of equipments available at that time. And this small number of 313 
who also included among them some lame people, some old people, some young boys who had not yet reached maturity. And the promise is so positive, so clear. This time, let them come. This time, if they wage a war, we have permitted you. And we are capable of defeat, defeating them. So God is with you, don't care. And then the principle of jihad is mentioned. If these ulema who cry out jihad, jihad, for political ends, if they read this first, it's impossible for them to misrepresent Islam anymore. The Holy Quran says, Walaula dafullahin nasa baalahum be baalim. La hudjamat sawamiyo wa bayam wa salavatum. Wa masajidu yuskaru fi hasmullahi kathira. If God had not permitted some to defend themselves against some others, then what would happen? La hudjamat sawamiyo. The churches and Christian places of worship will be destroyed. The places of worship of the hermits and the recluse will also be demolished and destroyed. Places of worship of the Jews will be destroyed. And then also the mosques will be destroyed where God is remembered so often. Now, have you understood the message and the magnanimity of this message? According to this, jihad is to protect the right of worship, basically. If anyone interferes with the right of worship of even a Christian, any defender of that right, if killed, will be a martyr. Because it's the right of freedom of religion, right of freedom to, of worship. So instead of mentioning the mosques in the first place, the mosques are mentioned at the end of the list. It's a fantastic thing. The magnanimity of the Holy Quran finds no equal in the world of religious scriptures. So this is the basic philosophy of Islamic jihad. Everything which should have been told about jihad has been told. If any claim of jihad, any interpretation of jihad contradicts this basic teaching and this comprehensive teaching. How can we agree with that? So we fully support this view, we agree with that and that is why it was Ahmadiyya Jamaat in the first place which declared the situation of, of Bosnia as jihad against the, uh, the invaders because these things did apply there. Because the Bosnian Muslims were persecuted and, 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 and vigorously attacked and uh, cruelties were committed, committed against them of a nature which even were not committed against the Jews in Nazi Germany. Yet, the world of Islam is lying inert, unconcerned. At best, they have doled out some money, and that after the protests lodged by the Ahmadiyya community the world over. So the proponents of jihad are behaving like this when actually the, came of, the time of jihad came. And we have been supporting their cause throughout. And Ahmadi, English, British Ahmadi was martyred there and the whole, the press, national press also mentioned him. But we have been going against all odds to help them within the scope of the laws of the country where we live. But the point is, why didn't they see that if jihad was ever made compulsory in the modern times, this was the time. They called jihad, you know what? They called jihad to fight against Iraq. They call it jihad. In the name of jihad, they collected the support of 10 Muslim countries. Because a Muslim country had invaded a part of the territory of another Muslim country, 
which they claimed originally belonged to them, which they claimed that the British had carved out of their land and given over to somebody else. They say this is the fit case for jihad. And in this jihad, all the great world powers joined hands who are not Muslim. Have you forgotten the, the news of those days when jihad was proclaimed at the loudest of their voices by Saudians and others who joined them? Even Pakistan sent a contingent of her army to fight shoulder by shoulder with Jews and Christians and Americans and Europeans and what not. But there's no harm in fighting shoulder, in shoulder to shoulder with others. But for a genuine political cause, for a religious cause, which you declare to be jihad, a holy war, it is not permitted to seek the help of the non-believers. Where did they draw their authority from? When they appealed to America, to Europe to come and join? If it was jihad, then it was not jihad. 100% I'm certain it was not jihad at all. If ever it was jihad, then how on earth could they seek the help of America, Europe, and other states of the world? Because, because according to the example of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu relating to the same battle of Badr, which I have spoken of, it is not permissible it is not permitted to permit a non-believer to join you in jihad. While the Muslims were so small in number, apparently and actually were defenseless unless it was the aid from Allah, help from Allah, they couldn't have won the battle. But at that time, some companions of the Holy Prophet jubilantly reported to Hazrat Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we have got to our side an Arab idolater who was known for his uh, valor and his uh, great uh, art of fighting, who had become a legendary figure in his, in his lifetime. He had come and offered his services to fight with the Muslims against the invaders from Mecca. When Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard this, while he was in such a dire need of help, he refused to permit him to fight with the Muslims. And he said, holy war, that is jihad, is for the sake of Allah. And Allah is sufficient for us. We will not defile the name of the holy war by permitting a non-believer to come and join, with, join the battle with us. Now, that is one most wonderful example. But when that man declared himself to be a Muslim, he didn't question. Because he never claimed to be all-knowing. He never claimed to be able to sing to hearts and find out the truth from there. He accepted the word of anyone, anyone and this was again a declaration of the human dignity. Every man is free to call himself whatever he is. None other has a right to reject that claim. So he said, I am become a Muslim. He said, all right, you are a Muslim then. And he permitted him to fight. So tell us how many European or Western countries were converted to Islam by Saudians before they permitted them to join the battle with them. None. They are politicians. They are only talking of jihad from their mouth. They neither understand the meaning of jihad nor they ever practice it when the time comes. Bosnia is a glaring example of that. Only conclusion you can draw from this comparison is that they think if a non-Muslim attacks a Muslim just for the sake of religion, that may not be jihad. But if a Muslim country attacks a Muslim country for genuine political reasons or others, or even not genuine political leaders, 
reasons, that would be a jihad. And practically, this exactly is the jihad in operation everywhere in the Muslim world. When they raise swords in Algeria against the Algerian government, that is a jihad. When they raise sword in Egypt against the established Muslim government of Egypt, that is a jihad, according to them. When Afghans fight Afghans, locked in an accretious pattern, that is called jihad from either side, from both sides. When Iraq fights Iran, they are both fighting a jihad. So jihad in reality is a fight between Muslims and Muslims and no more. So is this the jihad they are calling us towards? Unthinkable for an Ahmadi to violate the principles of the Holy Quran just to please the majority while they have no fear of uh, defiling the message of Islam. So this is the story of jihad and we. Thank you.